So I talked a little bit about the, uh, the limbic system, and it's important to understand its significance in that it reacts to the world. It doesn't think about the world. It reacts to the world. And that's what we can take great assurance from. So what happens when our limbic brain reacts to the world? Well, um, first of all, it reacts to just about everything, things we hear. I'm sure you've seen someone that's just received bad news, and all of a sudden their shoulders just collapse. This is a limbic reaction. It reacts to not just the things we hear, the things we see. We see a, uh, a car crash. We may cover our eyes. It reacts to things we think about. You see someone walking down the street, all of a sudden they hit their forehead, they close their eyes, they turn around and go back. They left the oven on. The limbic system is responsible for assuring our survival. And so it reacts to everything. People getting too close to us, people touching us, people looking at us longer than they are entitled to look at us. People who put uh, objects within our territory, territorial violations, cause limbic reactions. All these things, all these things are supremely important to us because they are so honest and so reliable and so with us at all times that we really don't need to think about them. So what are the limbic reactions that we usually see? Well, we said that the limbic brain is responsible for emotions. The first emotions that most of us uh, learn are the ones that we interact or receive from our parents. And so you see the dilation of the eyes, the relaxing of the face on the face of the, of the baby, and the mother does the same. And so you begin this process of the baby makes little cooing noises, the mother reacts the same. The baby tilts its head, the mother does likewise. This is called isopraxis, same behavior. We call it mirroring. We mirror each other. So we see it from the time a baby is born. Where do we see it later? Courtship behavior. You have two people dating. They're looking at each other. They both have tilted heads. In the business sector, where do we see that? We see it between business people. When people get along, they mirror each other. Do you want to know if the meeting is going well? Just look at whether or not the two participants are mirroring each other. If the person you're uh, dealing with is leaning forward, head tilted, and you're doing the same, things are going pretty good. If you're standing and talking, and uh, you know the person you're talking to is sitting there very pensively, they've got their fingers right at their chin, and, and they're, they're thinking this way, um, and you're doing the same thing, you're both thinking about something significant. But boy, what a contrast there is where one of you is perhaps sitting there very relaxed, head tilted and so forth, maybe the hands are in front, but the other person is standing there and they've got their arms crossed and they're looking at you with their chin in. This is not isopraxis, this is not mirroring. This is indicative that each party is, think is thinking differently. And you are communicating this non-verbally not verbally. So we need to look at uh, these first reactions of comfort, this mirroring, and these are the most important ones to show us when things are going well. Now, what about when things are not going well? Well, basically we have three additional limbic reactions. And the first one is the freeze response. And this is a very ancient behavior. This is what we see from most animals. When there's a predator out there, we freeze. You see this certainly when you go to the Las Vegas shows and you're sitting in the front row and they're parading these lions and tigers in front of you. You don't see anybody with their arms waving. You see people sitting there going, oh wow, look at that. And you say, how is it that everybody behaved the same way? This is millions of years old. This is a true limbic response to freeze. If somebody scares us, they jump out of the bush and scares us, maybe it's a prankster, we freeze. 
The freeze response is very important. And this often happens to us when we get on an elevator and we're surrounded by strangers and we feel that we're not breathing or we're not as comfortable as before. This is a true limbic response. And oftentimes uh, in business, you're confronted with a deal that makes you feel uncomfortable. That feeling that you get, that you're not breathing fully, that you're not as relaxed, your hands are not moving as before, this is a freeze response. This is your limbic system saying there's something wrong. The second limbic response to something negative is the flight mechanism. You know, and we often hear of the fight or flight. Well, this is not exactly accurate because if it was truly fight or flight, we would all be bruised and exhausted. It, in fact, is freeze, flight, or fight. And so the next thing that happens is when we see or hear or sense something we don't like, we move away from it, this distancing, this flight. Now, millions of years ago, if there was a predator out there, a lion or a tiger, we would run. If someone wants to challenge us and fight us, we run away from them. In business, what usually you see is distancing. So you'll see two people sitting around the table. They're discussing a subject. The person next to me says something that I don't like. And most likely what I'll do is go like this. I will literally lean away from them. This is distancing. Or something's presented at the table and it's something that I don't appreciate, I may just, in fact, move away from the table and distance myself. This is very subtle. Now, for the untrained, they may think, oh, he's just adjusting his chair, or he's just moving around to make himself more comfortable. No, if it comes as a reaction to something, then it's very significant. And if you realize that we distance ourselves from the things that we don't like, we now can begin to interpret what is going inside that brain. And that's why oftentimes when um, new things are presented to a group, you see a lot of leaning away, pushing away, uh, maybe turning to the side rather than fronting it with the, our full front. And we'll talk about ventral displays later. When we like things, we tend to turn our, the front of our bodies, the ventral side, towards that. When we don't, we turn to the side. Now, lastly, our third response is the fight response. Now, in today's culture, hopefully we're not fighting with each other. I'm talking about physical fights. But usually in a business setting, what that turns into is arguing, arguments. We can no longer just freeze. Distancing doesn't seem to work. So now someone will say, well, you don't know what you're talking about. This is really stupid. I'm not going to get involved. And so they begin to fight by using words to cause some sort of consternation or they may become passive aggressive, where in fact, non-verbally, the fight turns into something like this. Yeah, I'll have it done for you Friday, but then you take that day off. And so passively, you're being aggressive. And that's one of the ways that we transmit non-verbally this uh, aggression. <laughs> So we've talked about the, uh, the normal reactions that are limbic. The limbic reactions are mirroring, number one, followed by uh, the freeze response, the flight response, and lastly, the fight response. Now, for all uh, limbic reactions, there's one more thing that takes place. And it doesn't matter whether it's uh, things that are good, such as um, the uh, isopraxis or the mirroring behaviors, or if it's bad, the reactions, the negative reactions that, that we see with the freeze, flight, or fight. And that is that no matter what uh, limbic reaction we have, these are usually followed by, why, by what I've come to call a pacifier. And pacifiers are uh, behaviors that we see both in the womb, we now can see um, the baby in the womb sucking its thumb, 
We see uh, baby elephants that take their own trunk and stick it in their own mouth to, to pacify. We see, certainly see babies sucking on pacifiers, their own fingers, and so forth. And throughout our lives, we in fact employ these pacifiers to settle us down. The brain, in essence, says to the physical body, please help me out. Do something to calm me down. And this is very significant because in business, as we evaluate ourselves, as we evaluate others, we're going to be looking for pacifiers to let us know what's really going on in that mind. So we know there's going to be pacifiers for both good and bad, so let's see what uh, these will, will look like. But before we do that, we need to understand how best to model this. So if we're looking for all these behaviors that are reactive, these limbic behaviors, how do we model it? Well, the best way to model it is think of anything that goes on day to day between yourself and others or just in watching other people's and ask yourself, am I comfortable or uncomfortable? Comfort, discomfort. Are you comfortable or uncomfortable? Comfort, discomfort. It's one of the simplest ways to analyze the world and say, what behaviors am I seeing and are they consistent with comfort and discomfort? Now, beyond that, one of the things that you want to be then be thinking about is, when I see these comfort displays or discomfort displays, do I also see confidence? Well, obviously, confidence you're going to see with comfort displays and you're not going to see them with discomfort. But confidence is something that we want to look for because it's your confidence that makes me decide that's the best thing I should invest in. It's your confidence that says, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good deal. It's your confidence which is transmitted to me nonverbally that says, I should follow you, whether you're an investment banker or you're just trying to sell me a car. So confidence is certainly something that we want to look for or the lack thereof. Now, interestingly enough, one of the things that we often see with uh, people who are deceptive is we don't see confidence. We don't see any emphasis on their part. They know how to tell the lie, but they don't, they don't display confidence in how they tell it. So we have comfort, discomfort, confidence, lacking confidence, and the last one is, and it's a little bit trickier, but it is in fact limbic, and that is intention cues. Now intention cues are simply this. Person starts to look at their watch. Why? Because they have to go, or maybe they have to go put money in the meter. Or maybe you see someone, they're doing something, they're busy, but all of a sudden you see the right leg slips out in the very direction they have to go. Why? It's not that they don't like you, it's they've got something that they have to attend to. This is a true behavior. It's an intention of something the limbic brain says, hey, maybe I'm running out of um, a battery here, or maybe I'm running out of this, or I've got to do something with this. And so the leg immediately points in the direction in which it uh, has to go. This is very significant, especially for you in business. Why? Because you don't want to delay a person that's busy. I was talking to a gentleman the other day. We're having a great conversation. All of a sudden, I noticed his right leg just moved away. And I said, listen, Jim, I know you got to go. And he said, how'd you know? And I said, I saw your leg. And I said, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll catch up later. And he says, thanks. I've got to be in a meeting in five minutes. Everything was fine, but time was a factor. Now, how much better I'm received for being able to apperceive this behavior, to be able to sort of see what's going on in his brain. He's very appreciative. I'm not being a social klutz by keeping him there conversing when what he really wants to do is take off. So this is, now you're beginning to see how we apply these uh, behaviors and how important the limbic brain is in its honesty in telling us the things that we need to uh, look for. When you are with your clients, when you are with um, other people, 
um, you need to um, take into consideration, as we said before, these uh, nonverbal behaviors, both yours and theirs, and constantly evaluate how is this meeting progressing? How is it that we have gotten from where we were 20 minutes ago to where we are now? And is everything flowing the way we want it to flow? If it's not, most of the time, if it's not, most of the time, we need to think about the nonverbals. Is the room just not right? Is it too hot? Is it too noisy? Are we sitting too close? Do we need greater distance? How about this one? This, I, I ran into this the other day. The fellow I was with, you know, finally said, I need to have a smoke break. Why didn't I think of that? We'd been at it for almost two hours. He's used to taking a smoke break every hour. That's the fidgeting I was seeing. That was the discomfort I was seeing. How much better of a meeting that would have been if I would have merely said, how about we just take a break and just assume that this individual needed to get away for a few minutes. So these are the kinds of things that I want you to think about. Now, at this point, you may be saying, wow, we're, we're studying the brain, biology, neurophysiology, and so forth. Relax. You know, you're not supposed to learn all of this in one day. In fact, you have this material so that you can see it over and over and over. Look, I've been doing this for 30 years and I still go back to my original sources. I still read the books over and over because I need to go back and refresh my recall on these things. But be assured that you will in time incorporate these things into your life. It will become part of your modus vivendi. It will run as software in the back of your brain. You won't even think about it. You'll just be able to observe things and know instantly with accuracy that's what I'm seeing and I can interpret certain things from that uh, behavior.